I had a wonderful life, a loving wife, a daughter, and a roof over my head. I was really happy until one day my wife brought her lover to our house. It was painful for me. They humiliated me, and I didn't know what to do. I understood that there was only one way out of this situation, and I decided to take a chance. I know you've heard this story countless times. I believe my life was flawless until that pivotal day. That person was me, Ryan Moss. I was wedded to a stunning woman with an adorable six-year-old daughter. I encountered my charming wife, Tiffany, affectionately called Tiff, during my final year at university. She was a junior, and our affection blossomed swiftly. We tied the knot a month after her graduation. I completed my studies with an engineering degree and secured a satisfying position at a prominent national engineering firm. Tiffany also pursued her career, landing a job as a legal assistant at a law firm. However, two years later, Tiffany resigned from her position upon the birth of our daughter, Jenny. Our life remained idyllic until Jenny began attending kindergarten. With Jenny now occupied in school, Tiffany returned to her job at the law firm. I shouldn't have anticipated it, but I was blinded by my belief in my wife's love for me. I believed she loved me as deeply as I loved her. In hindsight, all the warning signs were glaringly obvious. Tiffany began dressing more provocatively. Our intimate life dwindled from frequent to non-existent, and she became increasingly distant when questioned about her long hours at work. When I confronted her about the lack of quality time spent together as a family, she reassured me that she was simply working hard for a senior partner, emphasizing the financial benefits for our future. Months before the day, I encountered her boss, Stan Cross, at the company Christmas party. To me, he came off as arrogant and dismissive. Despite closely observing them, I didn't notice any overt romantic gestures between Tiff and her boss. They were discreet, but it was there, hidden from my view. The situation reached its breaking point just as Jenny was completing kindergarten. With her heading to spend the weekend with my parents, I had hoped for a chance to reconnect with Tiffany and revive our relationship and intimacy. I dropped Jenny off at my parents' place, planning to return home for a cozy dinner and movie night alone with Tiffany. But as I entered the kitchen, Tiffany descended the stairs, dressed to the nines in a short dress and heels, her hair impeccably styled and makeup done for a night out. Wow, babe, you look incredible. I wish you had let me know we had plans. I would have rushed home. Just give me a few minutes to get ready. Where are we going? I exclaimed. Tiffany smirked, a sight that unsettled me. We're not going anywhere. I'm going out, but not with you. I was taken aback. What? What are you saying? I have a date, and this is just the beginning. We're establishing new rules starting today. My boss is picking me up for a night out and I won't be home. We've got a room downtown. What the hell are you talking about? I exclaimed. You need to calm down and accept it. This is how it's going to be. I'm going out and I'll be back sometime on Sunday. Bullshit. If you think I'm going to tolerate this, you're mistaken. If you walk out that door, don't bother coming back. No, Ryan, I'm coming back to our home. We'll still be married and I'll still live here, as will you. But you have to understand that I love you, but I need more. If you insist on making this hard, it'll be you who won't be living here anymore. It'd be a shame for Jenny's father to be broken in jail. Her remarks left me speechless. Just as I was about to address her, the doorbell chimed. Tiffany dashed to the door to admit her boss. How did he react? He inquired. Not positively. I believe you ought to elucidate the repercussions of non-compliance, she replied. Stan, not particularly imposing, stood about my height, perhaps a tad shorter. Mr. Moss, it seems we have some matters to discuss. Discuss? I feel inclined to give you a piece of my mind. You could attempt that, though judging by your appearance you might land a few blows before my driver intervenes and renders you unconscious. By nightfall, you'd find yourself behind bars, so kindly take a seat. Glancing out the door, I spotted a burly man looming behind Stan. Grumbling, I settled back down. Okay, now we can talk like civilized people. When your spouse agreed to work as my personal assistant, she also took on additional responsibilities. Yes, I mean a part-time job in bed. 
I've been dating your wife for the last six months, but she's tired of our secret meetings. The relationship between the two of you will undergo a change. As my personal assistant, she will fulfill my professional and personal requirements as needed. Mr. Miss, you are still Tiffany's husband. Your role as a spouse and parent will remain unchanged, with one exception. I will make sure that Tiffany is as comfortable as possible in bed with me. Usually these issues are resolved at the hotel or in the office, but there may be cases, especially when you are away from home, when we need to use your bed. Her remarks left me speechless. Just as I was about to address her, the doorbell chimed. Tiffany dashed to the door to admit her boss. How did he react? He inquired. Not positively. I believe you ought to elucidate the repercussions of non-compliance, she replied. Stan, not particularly imposing, stood about my height, perhaps a tad shorter. Mr. Moss, it seems we have some matters to discuss. Discuss? I feel inclined to give you a piece of my mind. You could attempt that, though judging by your appearance you might land a few blows before my driver intervenes and renders you unconscious. By nightfall, you'd find yourself behind bars, so kindly take a seat. Glancing out the door, I spotted a burly man looming behind Stan. Grumbling, I settled back down. Okay, now we can talk like civilized people. When your spouse agreed to work as my personal assistant, she also took on additional responsibilities. Yes, I mean a part-time job in bed. I've been dating your wife for the last six months, but she's tired of our secret meetings. The relationship between the two of you will undergo a change. As my personal assistant, she will fulfill my professional and personal requirements as needed. Mr. Miss, you are still Tiffany's husband. Your role as a spouse and parent will remain unchanged, with one exception. I will make sure that Tiffany is as comfortable as possible in bed with me. Usually these issues are resolved at the hotel or in the office, but there may be cases, especially when you are away from home, when we need to use your bed. I will not tolerate this, you despicable man. I intend to end our marriage because of her infidelity. Mr. Moss, such language is useless. Let's not forget about my profession. I am a well-known lawyer working for the largest law firm in this city. If you file for divorce, there will be consequences. And I don't just mean the legal aspects. Naturally, as a result of the divorce process, you will lose everything and will be forced to pay alimony while she continues her relationship with me. As for your beloved daughter, you will not have access to her. You will face serious charges of inappropriate behavior and parenting, which will lead to imprisonment and permanent loss of the right to date. Most likely, you will be fired from your job immediately. Your family and friends will disown you. I sat there in shock, at a loss for words. Stan continued, Now I know you won't do anything foolish. If you dare to inform my wife, you'll face Stan continued, is an excellent assistant. He leaned in close to my ear. She's exceptional at certain services. Still reeling, I observed as my wife left with her boss, now her boyfriend. I was devastated, unsure of what to do. I drowned my sorrows in alcohol. I woke up alone and hung over on Saturday morning. Tiffany didn't return home on Saturday or Sunday morning. She wasn't there when I went to pick up Jenny on Sunday. Holding back tears, I picked her up and drove home. Jenny almost broke my heart when she asked where mom was when we got home. I wanted to say, mom is having fun with her boss. Instead, I said that mom needed to work. The disappointment on her face caused me deep pain. When Tiffany finally returned home on Sunday night, she discovered me asleep in the guest room. Fortunately, she didn't enter. I wasn't sure if I could have stayed composed if she had. I was busy preparing Jenny for school when Tiffany suddenly showed up. There wasn't much conversation directed towards me. Instead, Tiffany focused on Jenny as we were leaving for school. She kissed Jenny goodbye and then attempted to kiss me, but I turned away and left. Later that night, after Tiffany had put Jenny to bed, she angrily stormed into what I had designated as my man cave in the basement. Are we going to have an issue? She spat. When you say we, are you referring to my problem with you spending the weekend with your boss? Is that the problem you're talking about? She stood with her hands on her hips and said, I never thought this would happen. It all started innocently enough when Stan and I had coffee in the morning. He liked the special creamer that I take with me to work.
I'm sure he couldn't wait to share his signature cream with you. Don't be vulgar, Ryan. Stan can be persuasive. Do you remember when I always said I didn't like sushi? To tell you the truth, I've never tried them. Stan claimed it was incredibly delicious. The first time he convinced me to try, it was also the first time we, we were close. I'm sorry, Ryan, but it happened. Fabulous. He even promised to promote me to the position of his personal assistant. Just think about the benefits, a higher salary, the opportunity to travel with Stan, and meet influential people. This is a win-win for us. And Stan mentioned that you could get back is a win-win for us. And Stan mentioned that you could get back into a relationship under certain conditions. Oh my God, I can't wait to hear about these conditions, I replied, feeling my anger grow. You can't talk to me like that, Ryan. You need to accept this reality. This is not a permanent agreement for a couple of years at most. We will have a much better chance of our future together. Do you actually believe all this nonsense? So in your world, once the esteemed Stan finishes with you, I'm supposed to just be there to grow old with you, huh? And then what? Just wait until good old Stan decides he wants to impregnate you and have some other guy raise the child. Tiffany hung her head in shame. Oh, damn. Are you already pregnant? No, but he's suggesting I stop taking the pill in a few months. I told him I wanted you to be fully on board with our new relationship before we consider that. I can't believe you. Get out of my sight. Tiffany reached the top of the stairs and turned back. I'll be waiting in our bed, but once I stop taking the pill, I won't be available to you until you know. This was getting out of hand. She needed to understand that I would never go along with her plan. I retreated to the guest room and my basement area, trying to maintain normalcy for Jenny's sake. During the following week, I conducted research on Stan. It became evident that he wielded the power and influence he boasted of. Seeking legal advice from a divorce lawyer, I was informed that going through a divorce would result in my ruin. The lawyer, acquainted with Stan Cross, expressed concerns that he might resort to concocting molestation allegations against me. Divorce became an untenable choice. Instead, the lawyer suggested gathering evidence of my wife's scheming. If I could obtain proof of their conspiracy against me, perhaps I could thwart their plans. However, she cautioned that even with evidence, overcoming Cross's authority would be challenging. She recommended using a discreet voice-activated recorder. Placing it in Tiffany's purse could potentially yield valuable information. Following the lawyer's advice, I procured a recorder resembling a pen and discreetly placed it in Tiffany's purse alongside other pens. Despite the recorder seeming like a slim chance, I began exploring alternative options. I found myself devoid of options, at least within the confines of legality. Determined, I headed to the library to utilize their computers. Having absorbed enough detective TV dramas, I knew the significance of the police coming through the prime suspect's internet search history. After scouring for a couple of hours, I formulated a risky idea born out of desperation. After a three-hour drive, I stumbled upon a dingy oriental supply store. Concealed beneath an old hat, sunglasses, and nondescript attire, I ensured my anonymity. Fortunately, upon arrival, I discovered the store deserted except for the elderly gentleman manning the counter. Approaching him cautiously, I inquired, I'm in need of tetrodotoxin and dimethylmercury. The old man met my gaze with a knowing smile, dealing with a cheating spouse, huh? I returned the smile. Can you provide what I seek? His smile widened. Indeed, but it comes at a price. Fifteen hundred dollars, cash only. I assume discretion is paramount for you. I assumed bringing 2,000 wouldn't come cheap. I counted out 1,520s and placed it on the counter. The elderly man disappeared through a back door and swiftly returned, handing me two veals in a paper bag. Be cautious with these. Small doses over time will be effective. He then included two syringes in the bag. These will assist in administering it. Avoid contact with your skin. It's advisable to dissolve it in a liquid for consumption. I snatched the bag and hurried to my car. Tetrodotoxin and dimethylmercury are both poisonous substances associated with marine life. Tetrodotoxin is derived from pufferfish and blue-ringed octopuses. When properly prepared, 
These creatures are considered delicacies, but in concentrated form, they can prove fatal as they accumulate in the body. Demethyl mercury is akin to mercury but more lethal. If allowed to accumulate, it too can be deadly. My research revealed that both dimethyl mercury and tetrodotoxin would gradually accumulate in the body until it was too late. Detecting these substances is challenging, but if discovered, they would resemble symptoms of food poisoning from spoiled sushi. The most advantageous aspect of my plan was that Tiffany would handle the delivery of the poison for me. She kept that darn special creamer at home until she needed to replace the bottle at work. A few months back, when I questioned why she didn't just bring it all to work at once, she expressed concerns about it getting taken by someone else. The creamer was her special indulgence. I suppose she meant it was exclusively for her and Stan. It was non-dairy and didn't require refrigeration. Tiffany stored her stash of creamer in the pantry. There were 11 bottles in the open case. I carefully selected one for inspection. The cap wasn't tamper-proof, but there was a paper and foil seal beneath it. I decided to start with tetrodotoxin on the first bottle, not wanting to risk exposure to dimethyl mercury, which I had read could be fatal upon contact. Following the instructions I found, I loaded the syringe with tetrodotoxin and pierced the seal cautiously. After slowly injecting the liquid, I examined the bottle for any signs of tampering. Satisfied, I repeated the process with all 11 bottles. With a nervous hand, I then proceeded with the dimethyl mercury, injecting each bottle with much greater care. Two weeks later, the supply of cream was reduced to 10 bottles. I began to feel guilty. I regretted my decisive actions. Tiffany's behavior made my decision much easier. It was Thursday evening, which we had scheduled for sushi night. On Thursdays, Tiffany and Stan often worked late and enjoyed sushi, which was a real symbol of intimacy. Jenny and I had dinner together before I put her to bed. Later, as usual, I retired to my men's cave. Tiffany came down the stairs looking defiant. If you're hoping for some kind of intimacy, you have a month left. Stan and I decided that I would stop taking birth control pills in a month. After that, I'll only have sex with Stan. Rage boiled up in me. I can't believe my wife allows me to have intimacy with her before she conceives a child with her boss. I'll be upstairs in our bed. It's been too long since we've been close, she said, smugly climbing the stairs. You've forgotten what real intimacy is, I retorted. Some might argue that I'm going too far and should simply end the marriage, but considering my circumstances, I saw my actions as a form of self-defense. Both she and her boyfriend threatened me with what I hold most dear, my daughter, and secondly, my freedom. Although I recognized the reprehensibility of my actions, they were provoked by the unspeakable threats they made. A week later, I noticed the creamer box had only nine bottles left. It took another month for the first symptoms to appear. I monitored her closely whenever she was home. Her complexion seemed paler, but it was her hands that caught my attention. Throughout dinner, Tiffany was flexing her fingers and wringing her hands. It became apparent that her nervous system was being affected by the toxins in the creamer, leading to its shutdown. Is something bothering you, Tiff? I tried to show genuine concern. I don't know, my fingers feel numb. You know, like when you lay on your hand and it falls asleep. It's been happening for about a week. I've also been feeling a bit short of breath. It's probably nothing serious, sounds like stress. Any new challenges at work stressing you out or making you uneasy? Tiffany's response was accompanied by a slight sneer. No, everything's fine at work. Two weeks later, the container had only eight bottles of creamer left. They must be consuming a lot of coffee. I'm used to myself. Tiffany's symptoms were becoming increasingly apparent. Body aches, shortness of breath, and a pallor to her skin. It was a Thursday evening, and Tiffany came home straight after work, surprising me as she walked through the door. What are you doing here, Tiff? Isn't it sushi night? I remarked, dripping with sarcasm. I'm not feeling well, and neither is Stan. He decided we're not working late tonight. Well, that's unfortunate timing, isn't it? Tiffany looked at me with confusion. You know that big project you and Stan were supposed to start? It's hard to deliver if you're both sick. Tiffany approached me closely to whisper, answering Jenny wouldn't overhear. Don't be rude in front of our daughter. I'm going to go lie down. After dinner, 
I escorted Jenny to her room to prepare for bed. Passing by our bedroom, I caught the sounds of Tiffany vomiting. I cautiously opened the bathroom door. You're not suggesting you're pregnant already, are you? I asked. Damn you, she snarled. I'm not pregnant yet. I only stopped taking the pill last week. Have some decency. I'm really unwell here. Decency? That's amusing coming from you, I retorted. I'm your wife, Ryan, and you ought to treat your wife with respect and decency. No, my wife died when she took that job with that jerk. She was replaced by some woman I have no respect for. If you think you'll receive any decency, respect, or even kindness, you're mistaken. With that, I turned and left the bathroom, leaving her by the toilet, retching. Tiffany wasn't awake when I dropped off Jenny at her daycare on Friday. Although I should have checked on her, I didn't bother. Around noon, my phone buzzed with a message from Tiffany. What do you need? I answered. I need you to take me to the hospital. What's wrong? I'm sick, but it's not me. It's Stan. He's had a stroke. I couldn't help but chuckle. Are you seriously asking me to take you to see your lover in the hospital? Please, Ryan. This isn't a joke. They said he might not make it. Concerned about raising suspicion, I decided to take the afternoon off. When I got home, Tiffany looked terrible. I helped her into the car and drove to the hospital. There, we encountered her boss's wife and one of the other senior partners. Larry Masters, the senior partner, swiftly took Tiffany aside. It was clear he knew about their affair. Tiff, do you really think you should be here? His wife is over there. Tiffany, oblivious to my presence beside her, addressed Masters urgently. Mr. Masters, I must know his condition. I need to see him. Masters motioned for her to step aside, with me following closely. You look terrible, Tiff. The situation isn't good. He's experiencing paralysis on his left side, and the doctors have mentioned organ failure. They're uncertain about the cause, but if they can't intervene soon, he might not make it through the weekend. Tiffany broke into tears, pleading. Please, Mr. Masters, I have to see him. Could you distract his wife while I slip in? Masters gathered with Stan's wife and relatives. I accompanied my wife to visit her lover. Stan looked terrible, with the left side of his face sagging. Though awake, he couldn't speak. Tiffany rushed to his side while I remained by the door. It made me sick to see her hug and kiss him, knowing I was in the same room. Tiffany sobbed harder until a nurse entered, urging her to leave. The nurse assisted my wife out of the room, leaving just Stan and me. Stan's eyes widened as he recognized me. He attempted to speak, but no words emerge. Stan, you're on your deathbed. Before you go, I want you to understand that I didn't heed your advice. I wasn't faithful, and I rejected your notion of a new relationship. Don't fret. I'll inform your wife after you're gone about all the deceit you engaged in with me and my wife. Before you pass, know that I orchestrated this. There's nothing you can do to stop it, you bastard. Alarms began sounding from the machines connected to Stan as I exited the room, prompting nurses and doctors to rush in. They managed to keep Stan alive through the weekend, but he passed away early on Monday. Upon hearing the news of her boss's passing, Tiffany was overcome with emotion, her health deteriorating further. After picking up Jenny from daycare that Monday, I returned home to find Tiffany in bed. She confirmed the loss of her lover, her bitterness still evident despite her weakened state. I suppose you're going to revel in this now. No, Tiff, I'm not going to revel. I won't pretend to mourn his death. He ruined our marriage, and he got what he deserved. Our marriage isn't ruined, and I can't believe you're so heartless about Stan. My feelings for him didn't diminish my love for you. It was just a means to improve our financial situation. You knew I would always come back to you. No, Tiff, that's nonsense. Our marriage is as dead as Stan. Remember, I was in the room when you professed your love to him right in front of me. Tiffany was in tears as I left the bedroom. By the end of the week, her condition worsened to the point where I had to rush her to the hospital on Friday. On Saturday morning, the physician spoke to me. Mr. Moss, your wife's bodily functions are failing. Her blood indicates unusually high levels of mercury and another toxin commonly found in fish. Does she consume a significant amount of seafood, perhaps sushi? 
I struggled to stifle a laugh. Yes, she and her partner have been indulging in sushi frequently over the past few months. Partner? The doctor inquired, puzzled. I'm certain you're aware of him, Stan Cross, the man who passed away in this hospital just this past Monday. He and my wife were involved in an ongoing affair. That clarifies matters. Despite his stroke, her symptoms closely resemble those of Mr. Cross. Unfortunately, I fear she doesn't have much time left. Her kidneys failed early this morning. It's just a matter of time now. The doctor escorted me to her room. Tiffany was connected to various machines, appearing extremely frail. Her eyes brightened as I entered, weakly gesturing for me to come closer. Her breathing was strained and speaking was difficult. Tiffany signaled for me to lean in. I'm so sorry, Ryan. I now understand how deeply I've hurt you. The doctor informed me that I don't have long. I need to hear you forgive me before I depart. I whispered into her ear, finding her with a smile as I began to speak. My beloved wife, I promised my eternal love to you when we exchanged vows. Through thick and thin, in sickness and in health, those were my words. Simultaneously, you vowed your love and loyalty to me. You violated those promises by demeaning and humiliating me. I cannot forgive you for what you've done to me and our family. May you and your lover suffer in hell. As a tear rolled down her cheek, I stood up and left as the alarms blared in Tiffany's room. Less than an hour later, she was pronounced dead. Telling Jenny that her mother wouldn't be returning home was agonizing. My tears were for her, not for Tiffany. Tiffany had attempted to end my life as I knew it, but I thwarted her. The doctors concluded that both Stan and Tiffany had fallen victim to tainted sushi. Handing Tiffany's body over to the funeral home signaled the end of any autopsy or further inquiry. No police officers ever approached me for questioning. I disposed of the surplus bottles of creamer and my toxin vials at home. I even retrieved the partially full bottle of creamer from Tiffany's office when I collected her belongings. When I arranged for Tiffany's body to be cremated, her parents objected due to their religious beliefs against cremation. However, I disregarded their objections as I was determined to destroy her body. With her cremated, any remaining evidence would be eliminated. Despite having sought revenge on Tiffany and Stan, I wasn't satisfied. I collected my various recordings and made duplicates. My first stop was at the home of Georgia Moss, Stan's widow. One might wonder why confront Stan's wife now that he was deceased. My intention was to ascertain if she was aware of and complicit in the events. I strongly suspected she was, given Stan's openness. As she welcomed me into her home, I switched on my pocket recorder. Mrs. Cross, I've come to discuss your husband and my wife with you. She interrupted me. You can stop there, Mr. Moss. I was aware of my husband's affair with your wife. Their affair was quite conspicuous. While it may not have been his first, it certainly was his last. I regret what happened to your wife, but as you can see, I also lost my husband. Thank you, Mrs. Cross. I want to clarify something. You were aware that your husband lured my wife away and turned her against me and my daughter. By not taking any action, you're just as culpable as he was. Wait a minute, Mr. Moss. I had no involvement in my husband's actions. I suppose we'll have to disagree on that, Mrs. Cross. From my perspective, if you had intervened with your husband, he might not have felt emboldened to pursue my wife. Perhaps my child would still have a mother today. Knowing that you were aware of the situation will strengthen my case when I pursue his estate for the pain and suffering he inflicted upon my family. I left her house without further discussion. Despite my lawyer's warning about the slim chances of success in pursuing Stan's estate, I was driven by a desire for revenge. In addition to targeting the Cross estate, I aimed to hold the firm where Stan and Tiffany worked accountable. Initially, my lawyer doubted they'd oppose us without Stan, but that changed when I presented a recording of Stan conversing with his partner, Larry Masters. As my scheme unfolded, maintaining civility with Tiffany became challenging. During one of my outbursts, the recorder captured a crucial conversation between Stan and Larry in Tiffany's office, discussing my resistance to their scheme. On the recording, Larry offered his assistance in implementing the plan, boasting of connections to law enforcement and the judiciary. He threatened to use these connections to dismantle me if I didn't comply. 
Though my lawyer cautioned about the recording's admissibility in court, we still leveraged it. My attorney arranged a meeting with all the senior partners, including Larry Masters, without divulging the exact reason, merely suggesting it might pertain to life insurance. I aimed for them to be caught off guard. As we entered their conference room, each of the seven senior partners offered their condolences for my wife's passing, including Masters. They all assumed we wanted to discuss Tiffany's life insurance policy, which was being delayed by the insurance company. John Hager, the managing partner, rose from his seat. Mr. Moss, each of us expresses sincere condolences for your loss. We understand the challenges you faced in securing the payout from the insurance company for your wife's policy, which our firm provided. I'm pleased to inform you that we successfully intervened to overcome the hurdles. Hager then handed me a check for $500,000 from the insurance company. I pocketed the check, Mr. Hager, but that's not why we're here. We're here to offer your firm a chance to resolve a troubling matter before we escalate by taking legal action against each of you individually and your law firm as a whole. You see, Mr. Hager, your firm was complicit with Mr. Cross in a scheme to lure my wife away from her family and to have me arrested, prosecuted, and imprisoned. Hager stood up indignantly. How dare you come in here and accuse our firm of such crimes and tarnish the reputation of one of our deceased partners? Mr. Moss, we won't sit here and let you make false allegations. Mr. Hager, we can leave now, but I can assure you that my so-called allegations are true, and I have evidence to support them. I suggest you simply ask Mr. Masters if I'm speaking the truth. All attention shifted to Masters, who squirmed in his chair. It seemed they were anticipating Masters to refute my claims, but he remained silent. Upon my lawyer's cue, a snippet of the recording between Masters and Cross discussing their plot against me was played from his phone. Hager rose, casting a swift glance at his partners, before turning back to me and my lawyer. Mr. Moss, if you would allow us, I need to have a private conversation with my partners. Thirty minutes later, Hager returned alone. What are your terms, Mr. Moss? Your firm will compensate me and my daughter with five million dollars or else we will pursue legal action, and the incriminating recording I shared with you and others will become public knowledge. It's that simple. My lawyer informs me that Masters is likely to lose his license to practice law, and perhaps the same fate awaits the rest of your team. Hager requested two days to deliberate with his partners on my proposition. My lawyer interjected, you have two days to agree, or we go public with everything. Two days later, my attorney contacted me informing me that they had agreed to the $5 million. He mentioned he would send over a proposed agreement. As part of the arrangement, we agreed not to pursue any claims against Mr. Cross's estate. In return, they would terminate Mr. Masters from the firm, invoking a moral clause that would deprive him of 90% of his partnership share. I accepted the terms and received the funds. I signed a non-disclosure agreement regarding the actions of Mr. Cross and his firm towards me and my family. As Tiffany had predicted, her affair left our family financially secure. Now I had to begin searching for someone to fill the roles of my wife and mother to my child. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.